My pleasure to introduce Professor Sharma, uh, PhD from Oxford, uh, from uh, Miami. University of Miami in Oxford, Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, postdoc at Michigan, and he's going to be a member of our Department of Engineering Science, uh, Engineering Science and Mathematics. Um, and that, uh, he's going to talk to us about the um, effects of aspirin on the product profiles of human cyclooxygenase 2. So we're, well, for those of us that uh, you know, take oxygen as a uh, you know, preventative medicine, I take um, aspirin as preventative medicine, um, we'll be most anxious to hear what uh, Professor Sharma has to say today. Thank you, Dr. Dorgin, for your nice introduction. <laughs> um, as he mentioned earlier, and the title of my talk today is Insights of, uh, into the Effect of Aspirin on the Product Profiles of uh, Human Cyclooxygenase 2. So basically, we are looking for what effect aspirin has on the enzymatic product of this enzyme. Uh, we call it cyclooxygenase 2. It's all, it has also other name. It's called uh, prostaglandin endoperoxide H synthase. But Commonly, it's called cyclooxygenase 2. And most of the work that I present today here, I did as a postdoc in a project. And uh, some of the, <coughs> some of the uh, work I'm continuing here, um, it's a pretty, um, I hope you'll find it pretty interesting. Um, so basically, uh, for this uh, talk, in the beginning, I'll give you some introduction and background about this enzyme. And uh, I'll talk about my research work. And at the end, uh, I'll give you some uh, conclusion about the observations that I made with those experiments. Um, so let's first begin by the term enzyme. Because human cyclooxygenase is, is one of the human enzymes. So what are enzymes? Enzymes are basically biological catalysts. They speed up of reaction without being consumed in a reaction. Any, and uh, many drugs like penicillin or antibiotics that we take, these are all enzyme inhibitor. They kill the enzyme. They inhibit the activity of the enzyme, basically. And uh, some of the poisons are also enzyme inhibitor. But those antibiotics that we take, they basically target bacterial enzyme, not the human enzyme. And uh, how do these uh, enzymes work? Um, basically, you have, uh, sorry, uh, you have a, a reactant, we call it substrate. And uh, enzyme basically acts on this substrate and forms a product. Without enzyme, the activation energy uh, between substrate and product is so high, it might take a million years to complete that reaction. But when you use enzyme, it might take just a millisecond. So that's how they speed up the reaction by overcoming this uh, activation energy. Basically, what they do is when enzyme is present in this reaction mixture, they lower this transition state energy, and then the quickly the product will form. And this is a diagram, uh, crystal structure of the enzyme that I'm talking about today, uh, human cyclooxygenase. <clears throat> so this enzyme has two isoforms, that means there are basically two uh, forms of this enzyme, which are uh, the, in terms of amino acid composition, they are slightly different, but they do the same work. They catalyze the same reaction. And these are called COX-1 and COX-2. Basically, uh, COX is for cyclo, short form of cyclooxygenase. And these enzymes are bifunctional enzymes. What does that mean is, they have a two different reactions to catalyze. And they also contain heme. It's an iron-containing compound within the enzyme, which acts as an activator. So what are these two functions? One is called, sorry, uh, COX, that is cyclooxygenase. And there is another function that's called POX, that's a peroxidase uh, activity. And uh, <coughs> this. Cox enzymes, basically, they catalyze the biosynthesis of prostanoids. Um, thank you.
biosynthesis of prostanoids. So we'll talk about what these prostanoids are later. Um, so these prostanoids are synthesized inside our human body. And uh, among these two isoforms, COX-1 is constitutively expressed in most tissues. That means this enzyme is basically a housekeeping enzyme. It produces these prostanoids which are useful in many different ways in our uh, physiological function in our body. But COX-2 is kind of bad guy because it is induced when there is something wrong in our body and it doesn't help that much. So basically this diagram tells us how these prostanoids, we call them local hormones uh, like prostacycline, uh, prostaglandins and thromboxin A2. These are the hormones uh, these enzymes produce and uh, collectively they are called prostanoids. And what happens is the food that we take every day, um, it uh, has a component called arachidonic acid which is a 20 carbon having four double bond compound. This arachidonic acid, basically it comes from meat and other uh, food that we eat. And uh, it gets uh, integrated into the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. And with certain uh, growth factor, this phospholipase A2, this is another enzyme, it gets activated and it releases arachidonic acid from this membrane, which is phospholipid membrane. Once this arachidonic acid is released, then these cyclooxygenase enzymes become active. What they do is they add two molecules of oxygen to this arachidonic acid. You see these uh, two molecules of oxygen shown in red over one molecule here and one molecule here. And uh, now arachidonic acid uh, converts to PGG2. The compound is called prostaglandin G2. In short, it's called PGG2. And uh, with the another function of this enzyme is power oxidase, as I already mentioned. That converts PGG2 to PGS2 by reducing uh, this molecule. So once this PGS2 is formed in our body, so its role depends upon where it is expressed, which tissue. Like in our intestine, usually uh, this prostacycline is uh, very useful, but in some other part, in kidney, maybe prostaglandins. So, so different tissue specific synthesis, they work on this uh, product and form different uh, ultimate products like prostacycline or prostaglandins or thrombox and A2. And collectively, these three uh, compounds are called prostanoid. So this is how prostanoids are uh, biosynthesized in our body. Um, these are the structure of these molecules. So you see the prostaglandin H2. And uh, if you count the number of carbon in them, they all have 20 carbon. And that's why they are also called icosanoids. And uh, once this prostaglandin H2 is formed with cell specific synthesis, they are again converted to prostaglandin D2 or F2 alpha or E2 or I2 or thrombexin A2. And uh, I'll just give you one example what happens when our tissue is injured. If it is bleeding, uh, this thrombexin A2 comes into play. It clots the blood and helps uh, preventing the further flow of blood. So now in the next slide, I uh, will talk about various physio physiological role of these uh, compounds. So whenever these compounds are formed in excess, they will cause inflammation and fever and blood clot with prostaglandin E and I. And uh, when there is a labor, uh, the, when uh, delivering the baby, you know, uterine contraction takes place and that contraction is caused by these uh, compounds. And uh, 
prostaglandin E and F, they maintain the gastric uh, mucosa, the lining of our intestine. Um, and uh, some of other uh, the prostaglandins like E or I or A, they also regulate blood flow and urine secretion in the kidney. So they have housekeeping jobs, but if they are produced in excess amount, they're going to be bad. So COX-2, the bad guy, usually comes into play and produces a lot of these uh, compounds. So this is the enzyme structure for this uh, um, cyclooxygenase. This is uh, obtained from a crystal of the enzyme, which is when it is crystallized and uh, done the X-ray diffraction, and they construct this structure. We call it crystal structure of the enzyme. And it has uh, two subunits, this one and uh, another this one. They're identical, so it's a quite symmetrical molecule. And you see the uh, yellow and green uh, structure inside, embedded in this structure. It's an inhibitor bound in the enzyme. And the red structure here is the heme compound that is present as an activator for this enzyme. And uh, you see these, uh, uh, this membrane, uh, this, uh, this enzyme is actually anchored in the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane, the bilayer structure. So you see, uh, it, it can have like identical two subunits. So it's basically a symmetrical molecule. Um, yes? You want to yeah, yeah. You know, I always liked these colorful uh, pictures. Uh -huh. And uh, now maybe there's a chance to understand it. So this, uh, this blue, what does it mean? That it means kind of you represent the geometry of some molecules? Um, it uh, represents the, uh, where the atoms are mm -hmm. in the enzyme. So basically, it gives you the outline of the enzyme. And uh, the color doesn't matter here. It's just to make it beautiful. The shape of the enzyme is unique to this enzyme. Yeah, it's so unique. It's it, this is clearly because, um, because first they crystallize the enzyme. It forms a unique crystal. And it is diffracted with x-ray. The x-ray gets diffracted from the electrons in each atom. And they um, record that uh, diffraction pattern in a film. And they, uh, from the software, with the use of software, they construct this uh, image. So that was my question. This is just 20 carbon atoms for all of this structure? Oh, no. This is enzyme. The substrate was 20 carbon. The enzyme that acts on that substrate. So how many carbon atoms here? Oh, uh, this, uh, it, uh, it is pretty big. It's like 72 kilo Dalton. That means 72,000 um, hydrogen atom equivalent. Okay. It's a pretty big structure. Enzyme, not yeah, not, not the enzyme is a biological catalyst. Yeah. But the substrate that I told you, 20 carbon, is the food for the enzyme where it acts on. And these dark brown balls, they are, they, are, they are not part of the enzyme? No, they are not part of the enzyme. They are, they are part of the cell membrane, the lipid bilayer cell membrane, and this enzyme is anchored to this cell membrane. So is this, is this, is this a part of the body? Is that in a, our kind of fluid or chemi chemicals or what? Um, enzymes are very small, you cannot see with eyes. When you place uh, together, you can differentiate water or enzyme. Um, so even with powerful electronic microscope, you cannot see it. You have to do X-ray crystallography to see the structure. But they function very efficiently. Yes. But the structure when it's frozen in a crystal is different from the structure when it's doing its thing in biology, right? Um, no. no, it should be similar. In crystal, it is static, but in biology, in the na yeah. native state, it is a three-dimensional and it's a mobile. But basic structure is same. Basically the same. Yep. 
So basically, um, here we are mapping the globular structure of this enzyme here, um, like this N terminal and C terminal represents the end amino acids because this is a chain of amino acid, right? Enzyme is a chain of amino acid. So you see this uh, green structure over here, which is a main catalytic um, structure that catalyzes and transforms substrate to product. And uh, like this yellow structure, membrane binding domain, um, since this is a membrane protein, um, it anchors to the cell membrane with the help of uh, this structure. We call it MBD, membrane binding domain. So these domains are basically independently folded structure. And that is governed by the intermolecular forces among the atoms present in the enzyme. And uh, there is uh, one uh, small domain called uh, EGF, epidermal uh, growth factor. And this signal domain is not present in a processed enzyme because what happens is once these enzymes are formed in the cell, this signal domain actually helps them to reach their target. And once they reach the target, this domain is cut off from the processed enzyme. So this first one is COX-1 enzyme structure, and the second one is COX-2. So they are pretty, basically very similar uh, structure. Only in COX-2, it has extra 19 amino acid uh, cassette in it. So here is the main structure that you should uh, you are interested in. What happens here is the 20 carbon that I talked earlier is a substrate here, right? Which is arachidonic acid, which is a very common substrate for this enzyme. It has one carboxylate group over here, carbon and other heteroatom like oxygen. Apart from that, everything else is carbon and hydrogen. And it has four double bonds. Right? So what happens is, in that green globular uh, catalytic domain, there is a kind of tunnel in it. So once this enzyme comes in contact with this molecule, this molecule orients inside this active site of the enzyme, this way. What, what happens is this carboxylic acid group positioning towards this arginine-120 amino acid residue. So there is a electrostatic attraction between this carboxylate group and arginine-120. So it helps to positioning this molecule inside the active site. This is the first step, what happens when the enzyme gets the substrate. It binds it in its active site. And then it acts on it. And uh, you see various uh, amino acids present. These all are from the active site of this enzyme. The active site, as I told you earlier, is here. It is in the main uh, globular catalytic site. And the reaction is basically initiated by this tyrosine 385 amino acid. What it does is it abstracts the hydrogen from this carbon hydrogen skeleton of this uh, substrate. The blue thing represents the hydrogen that is abstracted by this OH group of this tyrosine 385, that's how it initiates the reaction. It initiates the conversion of this molecule into PGG2. And uh, since we are interested in aspirin, how it works, right? So basically, um, people who worked on this uh, uh, enzyme, they found that serine 530 is the residue that particularly gets affected by aspirin. Aspirin binds in this active site and acetylates that particular residue and thereby it inhibits the activity of the enzyme. I will show you that later. So uh, this is how the substrate molecule actually gets oriented inside the active site of the enzyme and thereby the reaction uh, starts. <coughs> Um, this slide here, it gives us a brief um, overview of 
what happens during the reaction. So there are like uh, five steps shown here. So first of all, the box active site gets primed by PGG2 or endogenous uh, per hydroxygenase and then it converts into PGH2 and uh, basically what happens is the tyrosine uh, 385 that I showed you that abstracts the hydrogen it becomes a radical by the presence of this uh, iron oxide radical which is a heme uh, that red structure shown uh, bound to the enzyme and it forms tyrosine radical and this tyrosine radical is very critical because it activates this active site arachidonic acid bound in the active site by abstracting hydrogen and that it transfers this radical to this arachidonic acid and once this arachidonic acid becomes a radical two molecules of oxygen get added to this radical and forms PGG2 and again this PGG2 transfer that radical to tyrosine uh, 385 that's how the enzyme becomes ready for another catalytic cycle and finally PGG2 goes back to the POC site and gets uh, converted to PGS2 from their cell specific synthesis they convert it into different local hormones we call it prostanoids so this is actually the electron pushing mechanism in detail what happens this is tyrosine 385 is represented by Y it has a radical and it pulls one electron from this hydrogen once it has two electron it pulls the hydrogen and uh, there is only one electron remains and uh, um, another electron movement from this carbon gives a double bond and this radical carbon very reactive it immediately interacts with the oxygen molecule present in the environment and uh, it forms a bond with the oxygen and uh, it kind of gives you cyclic cyclic structure at the end and uh, um, this reaction prompts another radical reaction for the another oxygen molecule and ultimately it adds two molecules of oxygen in the structure in the original structure and why is it called cyclooxygenase you see there is no cycle but here it forms a cycle it added oxygen as well as it becomes cyclic compound so that's why the name is cyclooxygenase So the main question that uh, um, I asked before I started this project is how do these different inhibitors or fatty acids regulate the Cox activity of the enzyme? So it's not that every inhibitor acts in the same way. Different inhibitors, they act in a different way. So my job was to figure out how these different inhibitors act on this enzyme. So as you all know that um, NSAID, we call it, these painkillers, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory -infl uh, drugs, uh, is called uh, non-steroidal because there are other class of painkillers which are steroidal, which have poor ring system that is present in cholesterol. And uh, these drugs are not good because they feel you drowsy and they have many side effects. So people are now more interested in non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So the common drugs that we take whenever we have fever or pain is ibuprofen, acetaminophen, aspirin, or salicoxib, like uh, uh, this uh, drug which is called Motrin the main component of this drug is ibuprofen and Tylenol which has acetaminophen as the main uh, active uh, component. So all these are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and these all drugs act on this enzyme. They inhibit the activity of the enzyme. And uh, uh, first I started with aspirin. So what is inflammation? So when there is inflammation, basically you see red uh, tissue and with uh, swelling and there's a pain because 
Um, when there is something wrong in our body, usually uh, the flow of blood increases and you see the redness. And uh, because the capillaries, they get dilated and uh, it produces heat because it, it stretches the membrane. And uh, uh, due to the influx of plasma protein, because these proteins leak into the um, interior space of the tissue, and uh, uh, pain, because all these prostaglandins are formed, these enzymes get overexpressed, so you feel pain also. But this is a natural mechanism to heal a wound, right? The problem is when there is overexpression, when these compounds are produced in excess, then the problem arises. So this is the chemical structure of aspirin, uh, which we call acetyl salicyclic acid. So this acetyl group is important for the inhibition. What it does is, um, I already mentioned you serine 530 amino acid that is present in the enzyme gets acetylated or that means the aspirin actually transfers its acetyl group to the enzyme. So it's a covalent modification takes place. And this is very unique type of inhibition. No other uh, NSAIDs, they inhibit the enzyme the same way. Um, so in order to do the activity test, with the aspirin and the enzyme, first of all, we need to purify the enzyme. Where do we get the enzyme from? Actually, the enzyme was overexpressed in the insect cell. Insect cells, it had a recombinant uh, DNA uh, from human cyclooxygenase gene. When it grow, it produce more uh, this uh, enzyme, and finally, using affinity chromatography, these enzymes are separated. And uh, this is what it looks like when the enzyme becomes pure. And uh, it's called um, gel electrophoresis. Um, so you see that in the first lane is a marker protein. So it has different molecular weight uh, proteins are loaded into this gel. And uh, all these fractions that you get from the chromatography are loaded in all the uh, lanes of this gel. So what you look for is if this gel is pretty clean, there are no other substances, that indicates the enzyme is now very pure. Now you can take it out and do your research with that enzyme. Um, and, uh, and this is called STSPs because it's uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate. What it does is it gives a negative charge to the enzyme, and when you connect the circuit, all these enzymes move towards the positive terminal. That's how uh, it gets separated from other molecules on the basis of their molecular mass. So this is the um, equipment that I use for the Cox activity. What happens is you put the buffer and the enzyme and soft state in it, and the aspirin, and test your activity with the help of oxygen electrode. So what happens is, basically this enzyme is, it adds oxygen to the substrate molecule. So how fast it adds the oxygen depends upon the availability of the oxygen, right? And uh, as it increases its uh, activity, the oxygen availability decreases and the finally the rate uh, goes down. So this is how COX activity is measured using oxygen electrode or oxygen probe uh, instrument. And basically the electricity generated by this uh, probe, um, it gets converted to the data uh, that is recorded in a special software in the computer. Um, so here this graph shows you how the effect of aspirin took place on the COX activity of this enzyme. So the enzyme was 2.1 micromolar concentration, which was treated with 0.5 millimolar uh, aspirin 
at room temperature. ASA means acetyl salicyclic acid. It's a chemical name for aspirin. And uh, you see over time, um, it's pretty much, it reduced, the activity gets reduced. Uh, like after almost like 2.5 hours, do the activity remain same? You see that 160 to 180 is pretty much constant. So that means aspirin, though it reduces its activity, but it doesn't kill it completely. There is still some activity remaining. So that's the most important aspect about aspirin. Whereas other inhibitors, they completely kill the enzyme. Maybe that's the reason why uh, many of these NSAIDs, they, they have side effects. Because these enzymes are not um, completely non-essential, right? They are essential in some way. But overexpression of these enzymes is not good. But if you kill all the enzymes present, that's not going to do a very good job, right? Because all these prostanoids, they have some housekeeping function. And uh, I went ahead and um, quantified how much acetylation is there. Because I showed you a structure, the two subunits. Are these both subunits acetylated or just one subunit? And my result shows that just one subunit per dimer is, gets acetylated. So that indicates uh, the enzyme which cannot function if you separate the subunits. But this inhibitor only targets one subunit and reduces the enzyme activity. And similarly, I choose another NSAID called diclofenac. Actually, diclofenac is not in the market right now because of its uh, very bad side effects. But it also targets a serine 530, that particular amino acid that aspirin targets. So that's why I was interested in this um, drug. And I went ahead and did this um, activity assay, and I found that it completely uh, inhibits the enzyme, unlike aspirin. And uh, you see that I started with 2.1 micromolar enzyme, and with two micromolar uh, diclofenac concentration, it completely knocks out its activity. Almost 80% is gone. What does that mean is, it also binds to just one site, but it can kill the enzyme, just binding one site. And uh, this reaction was carried out at 37 degrees Celsius. And uh, another interesting question was, okay, so the aspirin treated enzyme is still functions. It is still able to make products. So what are those products? So in order to answer that question, I did this uh, radio um, thin layer chromatography assay. What it does is you have radio labeled arachidonic acid and you treat the enzyme uh, with that radio labeled uh, substrate and once the products are formed, you separate using this thin layer chromatography. So what it shows here is the, this is the substrate level, the band on the top. And you see different lanes. So this is a control. We didn't put any enzyme, so you don't see any product. So with the native enzyme, uh, without aspirin treatment, you see only one product. That's PGH2, that's expected. But when the enzyme is treated with aspirin, it shows two products. And we identified these products as a 15 heat, that's another monohydroxylated arachidonic acid. And uh, another product was uh, similar to the native enzyme, that's the PGS2. But the same enzyme, when treated with aspirin and diclofenac, it blocked completely the PGS2 part, but there is still some remaining 15 heat. So what we guess is the 15 heat compound is still coming from the acetylated site of the dimer enzyme. So the structure for 15 heat is like this. 
what it does is only one hydroxyl group gets bonded to the substrate. And this is the um, activity test. So this is only enzyme. So it's, uh, we keep its activity as 100% and compare with what happens with aspirin treatment or aspirin plus diclofenac treatment. So you see that with aspirin treatment, it's still the enzyme is functional though in a reduced rate, but it still it gives some product. Uh, and with diclofenac also, since one site already bound with aspirin, this diclofenac cannot uh, inhibit that site. And uh, the product that is obtained here is from the aspirin acetylated site. So the model that we construct based on this observation is that when we treat the enzyme, with aspirin, the serine 530, it gets that bulky group, the acetyl group. And since it is a dimer enzyme, and if you remove one monomer, it is not functional. It has to be intact. But aspirin only acts on one of these sites. So th this bulky group is due to the aspirin activity. The acetyl group that is transferred from aspirin to the enzyme. So now the product profile changes. The aspirin treated site now is giving 15 heat, whereas non-treated, uh, the non-acetylated site is still continue giving the normal product. That's how aspirin uh, treatment alters the product profile of this enzyme. So the 15 heat that we get here is from this site. And the PGH2 is still from this site. Yep. Does that mean taking more aspirin won't go to the other side? Uh, no, it won't go. The enzyme is a flexible molecule. It's not uh, a static molecule. It's uh, constantly in a three dimension and it has a mobility. So what it does is once something binds in it, it changes its conformation. It's an induced fit model. Um, we don't know yet. Yeah, we don't know. Because both uh, looks very symmetrical, so there's an equal possibility that it can enter any. This is the model? Yeah, this is the model. I mean, can you do... But uh, our observation suggests this model. Because of the 50%? Yeah, 50% of uh, both the products are formed, mm -hmm. and when you treat with diclofenac, oh sorry, when you treat with diclofenac, this side doesn't give any product. Once one side is reacted, the other side now is not available for the reaction. Yeah, you, you could do it potentially. But we haven't done that yet. Um, I worked on cyclooxygenase 2. So, what is your question again? Yeah, but we assume that because their structures are identical, very similar. So they both behave in the same way. That's our assumption. Yeah, I mean, that is true that I thought aspirin is the affinity of cyclooxygenase one, serine 5 to 3, or it has a higher one than aspirin. I don't think so. It, it doesn't have higher affinity, but uh, one one thing um, uh, extra information is like COX-1 enzyme activity is completely inhibited by um, aspirin treatment. So when you said you, like, it's mostly cyclooxygenase 2 and there might be some Um, 
I, I couldn't get your question. Could you please repeat it? Uh, actually, um, what happened is, in that lab, I only worked with cyclooxygenase 2. But other people were working with cyclooxygenase 1 also. There are some differences in the inhibition pattern of these inhibitors. But uh, basically, uh, they work in a similar way, like uh, aspirin acetylates COX-1 as well as COX-2. The covalent modification is same. But there are COX-2 specific uh, drugs which don't work with the COX-1. Because people wanted to kill only the bad guy, not the good guy. That's why they, they develop COX-2 specific drugs. Yeah. Some tests were done at 37C. Yeah. Is that an internal body temperature? Yeah, we, we just wanted to simulate the body temperature. That just seems kind of hot, but it's not. Um, yeah, but uh, since this is a human enzyme, mm -hmm. so it, it works better at 37 degree rather than room temperature. Oh, what insect is uh, SF21? It's a recombinant uh, uh, reproduced uh, insect. It's basically silkworm, I think. But it is a genetically modified uh, insect. It has this human cyclooxygenase incorporated in the DNA of the in insect. And uh, another interesting um, COX activity um, that we found with different fatty acids of this enzyme is, if you look at this structure carefully, you will find that all of these are basically same. They all have 20 carbon and they have certain number of hydrogens. The only difference that you will see is the number of double bonds, like it has three. It has four, it has two, it has four, and uh, three, two, and two. But these double bonds may be in a different position if you count from the carboxylate group. So if you look at this DHGLA and AA, you'll find that this double bond is missing here. If you compare this and this, these two double bonds are missing in this structure. But these all fatty acids are natural fatty acids. When we eat food, they get inside our body. So how do these, uh, these enzymes discriminate which is their natural substrate? So we did the COX act activity test. So we based our test on this arachidonic, which is the common substrate for this enzyme, and looked at the other activity of this fatty acid relatively to that um, compound. So you see that when there is a, this double bond missing, the activity goes up. When there are two double bond missing, the activity goes down very high, like 100 to 35. And uh, if there is an extra double bond here, the activity goes down way below. So only these double bonds can make a lot of uh, difference. So enzyme is so specific, it likes uh, these three double ones. Once you add or delete them, the activity goes down. So that clearly indicates that some of these compounds can be used as a future drugs because they have lower activity compared to the arachidonic acid or uh, DHGLA. And while doing these experiments, uh, in the literature, we found that, that was published in Nature, some of the fish oil component, which are also fatty acids, we call it EPA and DHA. EPA means eicosapentaenoic acid, and DHA means docosahexaenoic acid. So basically, EPA and uh, arachidonic acid are very similar. The only difference is EPA has one extra double bond. And they found that these compounds 
they ultimately form resolving E1 and uh, PD1 type of compounds. They can resolve chronic inflammation and they help cure cancer or other type of inflammatory disease. And uh, we were interested to do some experiment related with EPA and DHA to see the product profiles with aspirin treated enzyme. And uh, what we found is, um, let's first, uh, I would like to introduce what is uh, omega-3 and omega-6 uh, fatty acids that we usually encounter in the newspaper. Um, EPA is called omega-3 fatty acid because um, this tail, we call it omega end. This is C end because it has C group and it, it is called omega end. So if you count the number of carbon, like one, two, three, the first double bond meets at the number three carbon. So that's why it's called omega-3 fatty acid. And similarly, DHA, which is also another omega-3 fatty acid, the first double bond encounters at uh, three, number three carbon. So that's why it's called omega-3 fatty acid. But the arachidonic acid that we get most from our food is omega-6 fatty acid because the first double bond from the omega end, it, it meets at a number six carbon. So they are different in a structure. And the enzyme can easily verify which one is which. It is very specific. So I did the similar uh, COX activity assay with um, human COX2 and EPA. So you can see that this is a control with EPA only, no enzyme. So enzyme treated with EPA, it gives two product. And enzyme which is already acetylated by aspirin and uh, treated with EPA, it gives also two products. So what I found is, unlike in the previous experiment with arachidonic acid, uh, even after treating with aspirin, the product profile doesn't change with EPA. So this result may be significant because people are taking low dose aspirin and fish oil. Maybe these products uh, kind of give you beneficial physiological effect. So I was interested to identify what these products are because this TLC chromatography is not very efficient to separate all the molecule present in it. So in order to separate all these components present in HEPE, we have to do LC-MS-MS, which is liquid chromatography coupled with uh, tandem mass spectrometry. So that can identify each and every component present in a mixture. So, so very unlike with the arachidonic acid, the result was surprising over here. And, uh, I use this technique, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, which can identify the components in the mixture. Uh, actually, it separates first the, sorry, uh, the liquid chromatography actually separates the biomolecule present in the mixture, and the mass spectrometry actually, it identifies the separated components. And the result is here. Um, the aspirin treated human COX-2 with EPA. So this is omega-3 fatty acid. So what it did is it produced actually four different components. So these numbers indicate at what point of time did, did they get separated in the column chromatography. So since they all have very similar structure, the only difference is the position of the hydroxide group in the compound is different. That's why they are named as 11, 15, 14, 18. The position of the hydroxide group in the carbon chain. And uh, the tandem mass spectrometry is a very powerful technique. Actually, it identified all the components in it. And we found that the one that was eluted at 20.47 minute was 18 HEP and the one 21.48 uh, minute was 11 HEP. 
so what is how, how do this structure look like so this is the substrate epa which is omega 3 fatty acid once you treat with aspirin or without aspirin also the enzyme produces this product so the difference is there is oh group extra and the bond becomes trans instead of cis so we don't know the effect of this compound that's why we are interested in this similarly another fish oil component dha uh, first the enzyme uh, was treated with or without dha and subjected to the lc msms and the lc separated the component like two component were eluted at 24.96 minute and 25.24 minute see the i mean how powerful these uh, instruments are the lc can separate something very similar structure um, but with two different uh, distinct peaks and uh, these two distinct uh, peaks are identified with the mass spectrometry as 17 and 13 uh, monohydroxylated dha compound which we called hdohe 17 hydroxy docosa hexaenoic uh, acid Hexa means six, inoic means it has six double bond. In means double. So these are the structure for these compounds. So this is, if you count from this uh, carbon, it is at the 17 position, and this one is at the 13 position. And look at the structure, they're very similar, but these machines they can identify, these are different. And I also did uh, cyclooxygenase activity with uh, three different uh, fatty acids. One is the regular one, that is omega-6 fatty acid that we usually get from our food. And these are the fish oil components. So this uh, result is very important because you see the, this enzyme is very active with arachidonic acid compared to EPA or DHA. That means if you are taking more of EPA and DHA, you are incorporating these fatty acid in the cell membrane and the enzyme gets mostly uh, EPA and DHA. So that means the activity is reduced a lot. If these activities are reduced a lot, the prostaglandins will be formed in a lesser amount. So that is good for your health. Um, so all of these uh, fatty acids, when the enzyme was aspirin treated, and they function in a reduced rate. The red one is enzyme treated with uh, aspirin. The blue one is without aspirin treatment. And uh, we went ahead and quantified how much of these products are forming in each case with arachidonic acid, with EPA, and with DHA. So these are the products actually formed, but if you look at the numbers, in terms of percentage, uh, without aspirin treatment, the 15 heat from arachidonic acid is 6.8%, and it jumps up when the enzyme is treated with aspirin. And similarly, uh, you see the PGS2 is 84% without aspirin treatment, but after aspirin treatment, it goes way down, so that's good because you don't want this PGS2 a lot. With uh, EPA, um, we've, when the enzyme is aspirin treated, we get a new compound, which is not present without aspirin treatment. There is no 18 HEP without aspirin treatment, right? And the uh, most surprising thing that we found is uh, with DHA. DHA without aspirin treatment, it only gives 13 SDOHE, 100%. But after you treat the enzyme with aspirin, you get two different type of uh, compounds. So that might have some significance. So basically the message here is, 
Aspirin actually not only cures your pain, but it produces some compounds that might be beneficial for health. That's why people taking a low dose aspirin with fish oil component, they, they may be getting rid of cancer or things like that. But we don't know yet for sure. That's a possibility. And uh, wh where do these uh, hydroxyl group um, get bonded to this substrate? So these, uh, it appears that these bonds are, these double bonds are very critical. The double bonds separated with two single bonds. So for 11 ATP, the insertion takes place uh, in that 11 position. For 15, it takes place at 15 position. But they are around that double bond. Similarly, when the substrate is EPA, um, the 11 ATP insertion takes place at 11, and uh, 15 takes place at 15 carbon. And for 14 and 18, you see, um, there is a, this double, two double bonds separated by two single bonds, right? So if you consider these two bonds, there is also two double bonds separated by two single bonds. Now look at the uh, position of the hydroxyl group to that uh, particular uh, double bond. This one forms 15, this one forms, uh, th that one forms 14, and this one forms 18. So it appears that in terms of the structure, these double bonds separated by two single bonds are important. And the conclusion that we can make out of this observation is that actually diclofenac acts in a different way compared to aspirin. It completely blocks the enzyme activity, just binding to one site. And uh, aspirin treatment of human cox to promote the formation of 15 heat from arachidonic acid. And completely new compound that is 18 HEPE is formed from aspirin treated uh, human cox 2 with uh, omega-3 fatty acid EPA. And from DHA, uh, 13 SDOHE is the main product without aspirin treatment. And after aspirin tr treatment, um, there are two products formed from DHA. So future direction. So I am interested in exploring the role of these compounds. Are they beneficial? How beneficial they are? Where do they attack? in our body. Where do they bind and um, do the further reaction? So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and I would like to thank you for your attention. Yep. Present in birds? At birth, yeah, the babies have uh, Okay. Um, every living being, okay. without enzyme, they cannot sustain. Enzymes are nano machines. They are working day and night in our body. And without them, we cannot live, we cannot talk, we cannot think, we can do anything. Okay. So, but there's some, uh, some bone with excess already. I, I was thinking of, you know, like a PKU, for example, or some, you know, born something genetically, something with defect and that kind of chemicals? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question actually. What happens is these enzymes, actually gene produces, gene is DNA, right? It produces mRNA and mRNA gets translated into enzymes. If there is any sequence change in the gene, that's going to produce a defective enzyme. And this defective enzyme cannot function. If they cannot function, then we have so many troubles in our body. We cannot think, we cannot move our hand, things like that. So uh, the, the, the binding of uh -huh. enzymes uh -huh. to cell walls depends very, very strongly on the geometry yeah. of the enzyme. Yep. In thinking, I started thinking about this with this, this symmetrical molecule. Mm -hmm must be critical to the binding of the molecule to certain sites. Um, symmetry. 
um, actually what happens is um, all the enzymes not necessarily they are dimer they can function monomer just one subunit mm -hmm. so some enzymes um, having dimer they are symmetrical but some enzymes having dimer also they are unsymmetrical so it depends upon the but they, do, do they select other sites for binding like yeah that? yeah sometimes uh, the particular substrate has only affinity for just one site mm -hmm. And though this uh, cyclooxygenase is a symmetrical molecule, but uh, the research has shown that substrate can identify which side to go. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Good question. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. Um, ibuprofen versus aspirin. And so if I take a small aspirin every night, uh, should I also be taking the fish oil every day as well? Um, I told you because uh, this is not proven yet. This is my guess. Yeah. Well, I do the aspirin, but not the fish oil. But uh, what I would suggest from my experience is the fish that we take, how do we know they are safe? They are mercury contamination. There are so many pesticide contamination. If you take real natural fish, which is not contaminated, I would definitely say that's beneficial. Possible that, that ibuprofen has the same benefits as aspirin over the long term, um, or is it definitely not? Certainly, um, more data on aspirin, right? Yeah, more data on aspirin. Uh, I cannot say that definitely because I have not done research on uh, ibuprofen that far. But uh, I, I usually take ibuprofen over other medicine because that works for me. <laughs> but I take always low dose. Don't go for high. These are they always have side effects. If you would do simulation, what would you do then? Is that the simulations, are they based on some equations, or is it more on the geometry if we have mm. Yeah, if I'm interested only in a, a structural study of these enzymes, then I would do simulation. But at the moment, I'm not interested in that. It's big molecular dynamics simulation. Yeah, it's a big molecular dynamics. They do simulation and figure out how exactly it works. Um, that's possible. That's a, a physical study of. Do people do that, or? Uh, I I didn't do that because I am not good at physics, so <laughs> or simulation. So I just did the biochemistry part. But you have some good simulation. Yeah, I mean we can collaborate. We can collaborate. I mean if you are interested, I, I can help you whatever I know. Well, that's what the drug companies do. They do yeah. giant molecular dynamics simulations. These conforming molecules to see. They make this new drug, what happens? Yeah, I mean... Uh, like that. It can be very different uh, kinds of simulation. It can be uh, something where you have reactions. There would be ordinary drug effects with just tons of them. You mm. could uh, model these molecules as strings if you want to take into account some, some space. Actually, these drug industries, they are now doing simulation. The whole purpose is to find a better drug. And drug is a billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. So if you can contribute that, that's good. They basically see where it sticks. Yeah, they, they try to find out the best drug that doesn't have side effect, but it kills the enzyme activity. So one, I mean, one of the problems with, with aspirin is that it, it seems to reduce the clotting um, aspirin, no. It, no. Yeah, it reduced the clotting, you're right. Clotting. Yep, so yep. if you go in for surgery or yeah. toothache or something like that, they tell you not to, not to take aspirin. That's right. And the reason is that it inhibits the clotting. Yep. Um, actually, what it does is it, it, it kills the COX-1 as well as COX-2. Yeah. So COX-1 produces those uh, thromboxane A2, yeah. which helps in clotting. But if you are taking a lot of aspirin, you're not getting thromboxane A2, and blood flow will continue. But I guess the, the interesting thing is, uh, I think one of your graphs showed that 
if you take a lot of aspirin, uh -huh. the effect ceases. It's, yeah, yeah, it ceases. So only, only a, a certain amount is useful. Yeah. After that, it's just not, not helpful at all. Yeah, anything, yep. Which is a natural, a natural control yep. on, the, on the body's function. Yeah. Um, but what happens is within that uh, activity, maybe we're not getting sufficient thromboxin for the clotting. That could be a problem. Um, so um, what I would suggest is take low-dose aspirin and uh, yeah, it, hel it might help. <laughs> That's what I can say. There is other mechanism to compensate that. To compensate. Um, so far, we don't know because uh, these are the only enzymes uh, they produce prostanoids, and prostanoids are the uh, hormones that regulate pain, fever, and inflammation. These things. Okay. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. Thank you for. It.